On today's episode of Gathering the Kings. I'm not the highest paid guy in my company, and I don't ever want to be because that allows those guys to have an incentive to, to go bring in more business every year. You are listening to Gathering the Kings with Chaz Wolf, featuring fellow seven, eight, and even nine figure business owners who have real battle scars from business and life, but have prevailed as the king that they are designed to be. We welcome high-performing entrepreneurs to the stage in order to reveal the real of the real on what it takes to build a successful business today. We dissect the good and bad decisions they've made along the way that give a true and accurate picture of the journey of success and how you too can get there. Through this dialogue, you will learn the value of growing your network and surrounding yourself with power players and kings like today's guest. Grab your pen and notebook because we're about to dive in. What's up, everybody? I'm Chaz Wolf, Gathering the King podcast. I've got uh, Jordan Madewell here on the King stage. My brother, how are you? Good, man. Thanks for having me today. I appreciate you being here today. You're in a couple different industries. I want to give you uh, an opportunity to tell us what you're up to. Well, we are based out of Lubbock, Texas, and we have a general contracting and real estate development company, and we operate really nationwide in about 12 to 15 states a year. And we primarily build in the commercial real retail, automotive, and restaurant spaces. Wow. Okay. A lot of lot of activity in those spaces the last several years. Yeah. Yeah. It's been and busy. It's been good. A lot of yeah, a lot of opportunity. It seemed like a lot of those spaces were going to fall off the earth in 2020, you know, with COVID, but then they all come back really strong. They have, let's say, macro level, yeah. We were very fortunate that a lot of what we build for and who we build for were deemed essential. And so that allowed us to, we just kept rocking and rolling and actually increased our business through COVID and through kind of some of those harder times for some folks. So we were very fortunate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's great. Well, so I want to know, before we kind of get into your story and how you've built this kingdom, I want to know why. Like, why have you built it? And why do you continue to build it? I have, I guess, a couple of reasons. One, we, my wife and I, we started this business eight years ago. And the really the first goals were I wanted to be my own boss. I wanted to have the flexibility and freedom of working for myself. And then the second was I wanted to, you know, have a comfortable life, but I really wanted to come make enough money to have extra money to put into real estate. Real estate and rental property has always been in my family and background, and she's been a passion of mine. And so I thought, well, this is a good avenue to achieve that. And then if I'm in construction, I can do the remodel or I can build the property or I can fix it up or whatever. And so right. those are the two primary. What it's built into today, you know, that was in 2014 with me and a card table in the back of a shop I rented for next to nothing. And to today, we're probably pushing 30, 32 people on the team. Like I said, in States all over the country, pushing probably north of 40 million in sales this year. Made the Inc. 5000 fastest growing company list over the last three or four years. It's really grown some legs and now it's turning into how we can serve our team and how we can, you know, improve our community and how we can really almost kind of like a legacy thing. Yeah. I'd love to hear you, you know, explain just another layer on that. What is legacy to a guy like you? I mean, goodness, you want to talk about explosive growth and of course, a large team. What does legacy mean to you? I mean, sure. Everybody wants to build something they can hand over to their kids. I mean, I don't think that's unique or new or special. I think we're maybe, I think a little different than some people is we're faith-based people. We go to church. It's a big deal to us. And so we want to make a ton of money so we can give a ton of money away. And that's important to us. And we've seen in the small opportunities we've had to be what I would call outrageously generous, that it changes people's lives. And that's pretty powerful for us. And so we want to not only do that for people in the community or in our church, just affording opportunities for our team members to better their lives and to do things that they might not have the opportunity to do working for some more traditional employer. So those are some of the things. And, you know, we want to build, you know, some assets so we can pass it on to not only our children, but our children's children and so on and so forth. So that's been really impactful. And, and we've been able to 
kind of learn from some people a little bit ahead of us in our community and nationwide that we feel like we're doing that. Why re- why reinvent the wheel, right? Yeah, yeah, I love that. Do you think that, you know, because legacy, especially with your first answer of being able to pour into different giving opportunities inside the church or associated to, you know, different arms of the church, has that always been a heart for you and your wife or has that grown as the business has grown and be like, oh, wow, we've got opportunity now or tell me about that. I don't know your audience very well, but it has always been on my heart and I'll say it this way, Chaz. I believe it to be scriptural and I just believe it in how God made me is that I've always been pretty decent and in the last 10 years I've been really decent at making money and I just feel like God's put that skill set in my life so that I can be a conduit for him. And so I've always just been a big believer in tithing and offering and gifts and that type of thing. And even when I remember, you'll laugh at this, I've been married 13 years and I still remember our first year of marriage. We're so broke. We ate chili and and sloppy joes like twice a week or three times a week because that was all we could afford. And like, I tell my wife, if I eat a bowl of chili, I feel poor. It's just kind of a joke, but it's like, But even then, we would tithe on the little bit of money we were making then. And now that we have a little bit of more money, we just kind of feel like, man, it came from God. And so that's where it's going. And I think it's Deuteronomy 8, 18. It talks about your ability to create wealth comes not from you, but from the Lord. And we just really subscribe to that. And it's been important to us the whole way. And so we do our best to tithe on every dollar that comes through our house. It's incredible. Just what what I... I mean, of course, the principle of all that is just incredible. But what I really hear in you is that it's, like you said, you subscribe to it. It's a discipline. It's a choice that gets repeatedly made, right? Well, and I'm sure you've seen it and heard it, read it, but we've just found that is a really great way to say, God, I trust that you're going to take care of me, not only for my basic needs, but for my desires and dreams. You know, we often end up changing those or they change because God's got different plans. But I know when I don't hold on to that money and I'll let God use it, it ends up blessing me materially and spiritually. It's just a, it's a big deal. And we've seen it. I can point to a handful of measurable things that we've done in our career professionally, you know, miraculously or coincidentally, if you will, happen on the yeah. tails of us tithing. Yeah. So it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Yeah. hundred percent. Okay. So let's get into some business story time, some tactics, if you will. I want to know in the early years, All right. why this business or how did you get started in this line? I know you said kind of real estate's always been in the vein of your family. What about construction? How did that connect? So I'm a third or fourth generation contractor. My, my father was a home builder and did commercial subcontracting. My grandfather was in that. And I want to say maybe even his grandfather did some building even back then. And so, you know, I go to college right out of high school. They wanted me to go get a degree because, you know, we don't want you swinging the hammer. We don't want you in construction. Uh, You know, it's too hard. It's too whatever. And so not only did they send me to college to do that, number two, they never even showed me a trade. They never let me learn anything in construction while I was in school or while I was growing up because they didn't want me going in it. And so I tried my hand in insurance and financial services for about five years, right out of in and out of college. And while that worked okay, it just didn't really pay the bills and didn't really do what I wanted it to do. So I sold that little insurance business I had and kind of found myself back in building materials, sold building materials and windows and doors and lumber and concrete, a handful of things for a little while. And then ultimately found myself back into just doing light remodeling and backyard stuff for myself. And then just kind of grew it from there. And it yeah. was really catapulted, but it's kind of always been in my background, even though I didn't know how to specifically do every little thing originally or initially, uh, it was very natural and very comfortable for me because I've been around it. And so sure. very quickly, I learned all of the craft and trade of doing what we're doing today. What I'm good at and where I've found to be unique in the construction field is that I'm really good at building a team and I'm really good at putting deals together and I'm pretty good at the finance side. And so that's afforded me to take my background or at least my knowledge of construction and apply that to finance and money and it multiplies. Yeah, 100%. I love the backdrop. 
Tell me, in, in some of those first years as you were building, what was a good decision that you made that you can look back on and point to that one moment in time and tell us about it? Very tactically, you know, when you're first starting out, when you're a one man, when you're it, you know, maybe you and a secretary or something, you know, you're doing it all. And you basically kind of just have to do it all until you kind of get to where you're like, I have no more bandwidth. I can't do any more else, right? You know, I think a lot of people in the entrepreneurial world feel that, yep. experience that. And so I'm going to, I kind of talk with my hands sometimes, but, Good. you know, you go up and then you kind of hit that plateau. You're like, I just can't do anymore. I could sell more, but I can't do anymore. And so just learning to recognize that pattern of just kind of hitting that where you're maxing out your bandwidth and then either, it either basically it comes back to infrastructure. That infrastructure is either people or it's technology or it's, you know, buy a bigger building or rent a bigger space so you could fit more people on the, uh, but basically when you have to reinvest in your people or your infrastructure and your P&L dips and mm -hmm. that really sucks for a lot of people because they go, man, I'm not. I got to make less money now or I'm not as right. profitable now, but it's really just a short-term window. Yep. And so once you do that and kind of staff up or increase your infrastructure or, or whatever that case may be, then we found that it hockey sticks uh, shortly after that. And I've seen that happen about four times in our business. And to whatever degree that, you know, staffing up or reinvesting in our infrastructure is, we've just seen it happen over. And so now... We start to recognize, okay, well, we can't do this much more work anymore, but it's still coming in the door. Go get more people. Okay, well, and we're out of seats on the bus and I got guys sharing offices. We got to get a bigger space. Okay, right. you know, we've got to expand our territory. No, we've got to, you know, fly more. Whatever it is, we just kind of started to notice that. So I would say to answer your question, a long answer. Yeah, that's is, good. Is just kind of see that and like, you may be great at your craft get somebody to run the business in and free your up to go do more craft. Go be better at your trade and let them handle the books. Let them handle the, the payables and the receivables. If you're better at administration or kind of running that, then go hire rock star performers that can do what you're selling really well. Yeah. And what you'll notice is that starts to free you up to either do more of what you're doing or focus on other things that need your attention and not really have any, you don't really falter at that point. And so I did that first. And so in my business, it was a project manager slash estimator, I really hired him. And he not only came with some skill sets, but basically completely replaced me from the most time intensive part of my job. So it allowed me to go do more of it. And so our business doubled because of that. And then what I did with him specifically is I just built a team around this guy. He happens to be a real thoroughbred, you know, rock star type of employee. He, he can just do so much compared to the average employee, and that's great, but that's not a sustainable model. And so I started hiring a couple of people to just support him and to free his yeah. time up. Yeah. So I kind of started creating these little business teams within our business unit, and um, that led to even more growth. And that guy sells as much or probably more at this point than I do or did. And then as we created another business unit, I kind of tried to build another little team. And then so today we have about three, really four business units that I'm trying to kind of replicate that model over and over with. Now our commercial construction has gotten so big that I really kind of have a team inside the team. So yeah. that was what I would say, get that. And then the second part of that answer is get your books as clean as you can and, and get your finances in order. Doesn't mean you are perfect, but quit running your personal expenses through your business. What I did, this is what I did, Chaz, is I took a salary. I paid myself as cheaply as I possibly could kind of for a set amount of time. And, and I just, that allowed me to reinvest in the business. And in short order, I have a decent salary and, and compensation plan, but I'm not the highest paid guy in my company and I don't ever want to be because that allows those guys to have an incentive to, to go bring in more business each every thing every year. And so that's been a big deal with us, but get your finances in order. And if you can't do it, get somebody that can help you with that, that you trust yeah. and then hire those key people. I would say those two things were early on. And I say early on in the first one to three years, yeah. one to four years of my business. And it's just went through the roof. There's a couple of books that I've read over the years that I would say are very impactful and that we use in some form or element today. 
Okay. Profit First is a book by a guy named Mike McCallowitz. And we use that thing religiously in all of our business units. Great book. It, uh, the way I describe it is how Dave Ramsey's great for personal finance. This has been the best kind of map or set of tools I can use for business finance or money management. So that's been right. awesome. Math, I haven't used religiously, but I have taken a lot of their pr- principles and kind of bringing on people and pulling people up and promoting within and bringing in new entry level people. That's been helpful. And then we're right now, our team, our management team, kind of my executive folks, we're going through the book called Scaling Up and just kind of how to to grow our businesses. And, and it talks about cash execution strategy and people and how each of those things you have to implement in a really high effective way. And if you do, then, you know, you go from the next level. It's kind of the old, what got me here does not get me to there. And so that's what we've been doing actually recently. That's awesome. Yeah. So much value there. You even summarized it. So I don't have to. <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> the the listener should pause and re-listen to that. You should take me up on that. You should pause. You should go back and listen to that again. Hey, Chaz Wolf here. As many of you know, I have been on an absolute mission to help entrepreneurs from all across the country in many different industries level up their game and grow their business and intentionally connect with other entrepreneurs. We do that obviously through the podcast, but we also have a peer-to-peer mastermind group specifically for seven to nine-figure business owners. We are bringing some of the best and most successful entrepreneurs and minds together in a regular and super intentional way to not only grow our network, but to be able to leverage. And at a certain point in business, success becomes about leverage, leveraging time, leveraging resources, leveraging key relationships. This is exactly what we're doing inside of the peer-to-peer mastermind group called Gathering the Kings, specifically for seven to nine-figure business owners. So if that's you, if you're ready to level up your seven to nine-figure business even to the next level and get around other big hitters just like you, I want you to go to gatheringthekings.com, fill out a short application, And uh, it'll come to an application uh, call with me. And I want to chat with you to see if it might be a good fit. Talk soon. Now, I want to know the opposite side of the coin here, Jordan. I want to know the moment in time where you weren't, you didn't have your best day. You didn't make your best decision. I guess I would answer that two ways, Chaz. Like the first thing I would say is don't make mistakes, but don't make fatal ones. In our business specifically, We try to never take on a specific construction project that represents more than a certain percentage of our annual sales. Sure. Just because if it goes wrong, that's a big hickey to overcome. So that's one thing we did to try to kind of mitigate risk. Number two, you know, everybody has a rough project or a rough day or, or, you know, a patch. And so you try to be introspective with it and you try to go, hey, why, why did that not go the right way? Usually... There's a handful of variables that you can kind of point to, not always, but what I've also seen is you kind of have to just expect not everything to go perfectly. You know, everybody plans stuff out perfectly on paper, right? but invariably one out of every so many of our construction jobs don't go exactly like we want. Yeah. And as much as we try to fix that and tweak that and implement things and that helps, things still just don't go great all the time. And so... You can't let that define you and you can't let that beat you up to where you're just like, well, I'm never doing something again. I'm never not, you know, you just can't have that attitude. You have to kind of have this, uh, you know, well, we're not giving up and that's not stopping us. And we'll just, we'll do it. We'll do better next time. You have to have that mentality and attitude. I think, especially in my business, but I'm sure it's different with other businesses. It's just, it's a high stress deal. And so you kind of have to just say, well, just because that didn't go right doesn't mean we're stopping this. You're never trying it again. Exactly. Exactly. Do you have, you know, you kind of mentioned maybe it was a project that didn't go well, or maybe it was a hiring choice. Anything that, that you can kind of tell us about a moment in time that happened specifically to you? Before I got in this construction business, I tried working with multiple people over and over. And I think, I think one of the things I do or did was I kind of just probably blindly or ignorantly trusted those people on sure. what they told me they could do. and. You know, those things didn't pan out. And so that didn't work. And I had setbacks because of that. But so I think that was part of it. You know, you, we try to hire well here or we try to uh, take on new clients here. And all of it's what the expectation is that, you know, they are going to do what they say they're going to do. And that just didn't always happen. And so right. I think having the, I think often, at least I, my temptation is to, with that, is to just believe them or just, well, I'll give them a little time to figure that out. We're all, they'll come around and 
Sometimes I just don't. And being able to kind of go, look, this isn't working. And uh, we've got to, we've got to stop the bleeding or we've got to fix it or we've got to replace you or we've got to do something. And so when you're at the leader of an organization, you, at least me, I'm like, hey, I want to be compassionate or I want to be generous or I want to be gracious. And maybe they're going through hard times or maybe something's happening. But what you're really doing is you're telling the rest of your team that I'm okay with incompetence. I'm okay with lackluster performance. I'm okay with them not taking care of business. And so you're really just telling the rest of the team, you know, they're the exception or they can do whatever they want. And you're, you know, it doesn't matter. And so I'm trying to grow as a leader to say, you know, can't, that can't happen because it pulls the rest of the team down and what you've worked so hard to put around you. People are like, he's saying this, but doing that, you know, and I, and I'm, right. you know, you want, you want to try to walk your talk, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, hundred percent. What sort of and maybe maybe you can cross this over even to the personal side since you started with, you know, the decisions around tithing and that type of sure. thing. But what process do you take a decision through? Like when it comes to your desk, even in the business or in personal life, is there a discipline? Is there a process that you kind of formulate an answer? When I guess I'll I'll you just stop me where, but I'll just kinda of answer that in two or three different ways. When I have big, heavy decisions or important decisions. Okay. I try to to get more than my own input. Okay. So I, you know, in the council of many, there's wisdom type of deal. And so I try to get people that are, it, and I would say, make those council relevant. You know, there may be super, someone super smart, but they're in education or academics. Well, as much as I trust and respect that person, they're not going to be able to speak into my life in the construction business. Sure. And so I try to grab people that are relevant and have the wisdom of re- it, it in all, the relevant area of my life and try to, con- you know, it basically if I'll do a good job of presenting that in, a, in an unbiased way to a handful of people and I start seeing a pattern in their answers, that's probably the wisdom I'm looking for. And, and you can't be too arrogant or uh, stubborn to hear it because it may not be what you really want to do, but yeah. it may be the right answer. So that's one thing people have heard of the, you know, you kind of, list out your pros and cons. I do a 2.0 to that. I actually try to weight each pro and con on a scale of zero to 10 of how important it is to you. Because people are like, oh, I've got three pros and three cons. That didn't do any good. But maybe one of the cons weighs more than the other. Maybe one of the pros. And so basically that helps me quantify an emotion, if if that makes sense. And so I'll do that from time to time. You know, obviously we try to use our faith as a backbone of our decision-making or, or the lens to, to how we make those decisions. And generally that's a pretty easy thing for us. Not always, but it's pretty easy. And so we try to lay that lens over kind of what we're doing and why. And then if I'm doing really well, I, I take the perspective of kind of what we've set with monthly or quarterly or annual or, or kind of multi-year goals, you know, is what we're yeah. doing in this little moment going to propel me towards my annual goals personally or professionally or where I want to be in three or five years. And so if I'm doing really well, I'll feed it through that perspective as well. Yeah. You've very thorough, three different examples, clearly lots of different types of decisions that, that uh, guys have to make in business. And so, um, yeah, there's different levels. There's different ways of thinking, different ways of processing. Sure. So I appreciate that perspective. I want to come at you with a couple of different type, maybe a different angle of questioning. I call it the sure. speed round, but we're, we'll wrap up here pretty quickly. I want to know, my first question is this. I want to know if you can dwindle your entire business down into one trackable metric that you would just be able to track that one thing forever. What would that one metric be? Oh gosh, that's super hard. I would say <laughs> if I had to give you one, or maybe I'd give you the first, would be leads. Okay. Uh, you know the one- rest of the story from that. Well, the reason is if I don't have sales, I have nothing else to track. Right. But really one step before that, if I don't have enough leads coming in, I'm not going to close enough deals. I, I don't know if this is a law. I don't know if this is a whatever, but we have noticed no matter if it's my smallest division of my business where we do repair all the way to my big, huge commercial projects, we close in between 20 and 30% of what we quote for estimate. I don't know why. I don't know how scientific that is, but that's what we do. (laughs) That's the number. And so that allows me to kind of go, hey, let's back into that. I want to hit this much in sales or I have to hit this much in income or I have to do whatever. And I'm only closing 20 to 30%. 
And I know I need to go quote or estimate five to six times or whatever that math is. Right. right. Uh, and so if I'm watching and inspecting how much we're, then I know we're going to close this much. Otherwise, then we'll be okay. And then I can do the next most important thing, like watching expenses or tracking profit sure. margin or right. you know, how quickly we c- convert our cash cycle or all those things. But that's what I would probably, if I had to give you one. Yeah, that's good. Super good perspective too, because I think it, it dwindles it down to you know, survival, really. If you don't have that, then you got nothing anyway. Yeah. Okay, you've already given us a couple book recommendations, so appreciate that. Next question is, do you intentionally network or mastermind with other entrepreneurs? Really not as formal as I should. Like, sure. Yes, I do. I go to a couple conferences every year. Some are in my street. Sure. Some are in more real estate investing type of industry. Uh, yeah. But yeah, usually I'm going to a couple of conferences or meetups or networking, but they're bigger. And I do that two or three times a year. Honestly, I, I network a lot naturally at my yeah. church. I network naturally just, you know, we're in Lubbock, Texas Tech University is here, big football and sports in our town. And so we see people out at events, yeah. you know, and that's natural. And my brother, he makes me look introverted. He's super extroverted guy. And that's what he harps on. Paul, his team on his business is use your natural habitat to network. And then to answer, I think what you're asking me is how do I grow as a person or how do I grow my network is yeah. I've always been a lifelong learner. Obviously, that's why a lot of what you do and what your audience is doing, but sure. find the five or six people that you want to emulate and if you do it in a very humble and non-annoying way, most of the time those <laughs> people will share some things with you. Yeah. Most of the time those people are flattered or they go, hey, I remember when I was not right. as big as I was, I'm happy to help. And so I've always just been you know, willing to ask, hey, how did you get here? Really great at this. What did you do? And I try to learn from those people. So so I, that that's the front end of that. And then I've as of recent this year, I've started hiring a leadership development coach just to help me manage well and lead well. I just think while I understand a lot of things and have a good perspective, I've never ran a company this big before. So I'm not, right. I'm trying not to be so arrogant to think I could learn something and help serve my team better. And he says, always says, uh, hey, the bottleneck is at the top. And and I laugh at that, but it's true. It's like, you know, we're only going to grow as, as much as my ability to lead. And so hired a leadership coach to try to help me think better and learn. And so we're doing that. And I've never done that before. And then I read all the time. I try to read a book a month, a couple books a month, depending on what it is. So good. Again, just super quality. If the listener's paying any source of attention, they've got their earful. I've got one tactical question for you, and then we'll end off with our last one. The tactical question is this, if you only had one hour, Jordan, one hour in a week, any get like going forward, just one hour a week to work in your business or on your business, what would you do or how would you use that one hour to successfully run your business? I would probably, golly, I, you got me, Jess. I would say I would probably start with just measuring what those people are doing, my teams are doing, either you know, last week, this week, kind of in that moment. And I would measure that against what our company's goals are. And that would really quickly tell me, are we on track or do we need to increase or do we need to cut back or do we need to save money or do we need to do something? So I'd probably try to get each division to kind of give me a little summary of what's going on at any given time and how that, and that's what we're trying to build here and do a better job of is try to get them to, okay, that, that fits our quarterly or our annual goals. And so right. I would try to just do that. And then a lot of goal setting, just such a big believer in goal setting in any shape or form. It just, not only does it help you keep focused, it, I believe there's some kind of mental, physical change that happens in your brain that kind of helps you work towards those things on a subconscious level. 100%. So that's probably a terrible answer, but that's kind <laughs> of off the top of my head. And now I'm yeah. thinking, if only had an hour a day I'd, or an hour a week, I'd be a... I'd go crazy. So it'd be a mess. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, it, it, if anything, it gives you a, a new way of thinking. <laughs> absolutely. Okay. Last question here for you, Jordan. Sure. If you lost it all, everything, what would you do? Professionally speaking, I guess is what you're asking me. Sure. I'd probably, I would probably either, you know, for somebody that, that's happened to 
you're, you have a circle of influence or a circle that you're influenced by, and I would tap into that group because chances are, if you're a good person, if you're likable and personable and you're one somebody could trust, they're going to want you on their team. So I'd probably reach out to somebody in my circle that I've worked with and say, hey, is there something I can do to add value? And chances are you'll get picked up and you can kind of start over. That's what I would say is a piece of advice to somebody is don't go to another industry. Don't try something. You've already spent years getting good at this. Somebody else can use that skill set. Yeah. If I had to start over doing what I'm doing over again, you know, I just say, just be patient because now you are going to get to where you were twice as fast because now you know how to do it. Much of and so just don't give up. You know, if I lost it all, I would turn right around tomorrow and I would start knocking on doors and selling backyard patios and fences again. And I'd get, you know, I'd start building up sales again and I, you know, I'd just start over. Yeah. But instead of it taking me eight, nine years, I'd do it in a four and a half. Yeah. Yeah. So Percent. that's what I would do. Just don't give up. Don't give up. Even though it's hard, don't give up. That's right. It's good. Jordan, how can the listener connect with you further past this call? Or maybe they can, maybe they even have a project that they need to hire you for. Hey, that'd be great. I'm fairly Googleable, if that's a word. So you can Google my first and last name or Madewell Construction. My first and last name at Gmail is my personal email. I'm happy to share that with people. Uh, if they have any follow-up questions, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm pretty active on LinkedIn. So you'll see me post there. If you want to see stuff about my kids, you know, I'm sure I'm on, you can find me on Facebook, but sure. But man, I'm happy to help any way I can with people. Good. I can tell you what's cost me a lot of money or what I wouldn't do again. But but yeah, just Google me on that or, or some of our company websites. It's pretty easy to find me. Yeah, it's good. You've been incredible here today. Thank you for your time. I just, uh, I'm excited to, to continue the conversation with you, get to know you better, but we just appreciate it. And then of course, just nothing but success, blessing on your family, your business, your teams, all of that. So we just really appreciate it. Thank you for being here. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Gathering the Kings today. I hope that you were able to pull out a few nuggets to go apply into your business right away. More importantly, though, I hope that you're realizing that it takes more to be successful than just being by yourself, doing it all on your own, carrying the weight all by yourself. What I have realized, not only in my own journey from multiple businesses and multiple different industries and now interviewing over two or 300 other very successful seven, eight and nine figure business owners is that it's tough to do it alone. And so Gathering the Kings exists to bring together successful entrepreneurs. In fact, we are putting together 1,000 kings, specifically who are grateful, but not done. We're intentionally assembling kings who fight tooth and nail for their business, family, and communities. And here's what we believe, that in the pursuit of excellence in those areas, that it ignites within us the responsibility to govern power and forge a lasting legacy. So if that relates and, and resonates with you, and you know that you need people around you, sharp, qualified, other very successful business owners, I want you to go to gatheringthekings.com. I want you to take a look at what we're doing and see if it makes sense for you to be part of our pursuit to 1000 Kings. Talk soon.